Amen. Well, let's say thank you again to those students. They did an awesome job. <clears throat> those are our musical boot campers, and I've been told that those that performed this morning represent only about half of the ones that were actually involved and performed on Friday evening. So it was a great gift to our church family. I also want to say, I know it's been said before, but I want to say again, happy Father's Day to all of you men uh, who are with us this morning. Your role in the family is so, so critically important, and uh, we honor you, and we hope that you know how valued and loved you are, and we pray that you get a really long nap today, because you deserve it. So, I'm excited to get back into the Word, specifically into the book of Exodus with all of us together this morning, and I'd like to just pause and pray together before we do that. Father, we gather again this morning and worship to you, and you are such a faithful God and such a loving God. You are a gracious God, and Lord, we are reminded through the song of these young people today that there is true freedom in Christ. Now, while we were yet slaves to sin and bondage and separated from you, Christ died for us. And this gift of salvation, Father, opened up a whole new relationship with you, one that is unlike any relationship we will ever experience. And so, God, I ask that you would speak to us this morning and that you would draw our hearts into a deeper relationship with you today. We love you and we honor you, and we ask for your indwelling spirit to fall afresh upon us today. We pray these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, I want to invite you to open them to our text, which is Exodus 24. If you'd like to make use of a pew Bible, or better yet, take one as our gift to you. If you're in need of one, you will find Exodus 24 on page 64. And if you've been worshiping with us over the past months, you'll know that we've been working our way through the book of Exodus, specifically now in the second half of Exodus, through a series entitled God With Us. And you'll likely recognize this slide uh, from previous messages. It's simply a snapshot of where we've been and where we're going. And so most recently in our study, God has given the law both through the Ten Commandments and a more expanded version in what we recognize as the Book of the Covenant. And then we come to chapter 24, and it's time to seal the deal. It's time to ratify the covenant before the Israelites can journey forward towards the Promised Land. And so that's where I want to pick up the story with all of you this morning in Exodus 24, if you'll begin reading with me. Then he said to Moses, come up to the Lord, you and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel and worship from afar. Moses alone shall come near to the Lord, but the others shall not come near and the people shall not come up with him. Moses came and told the people all the words of the Lord and all the rules and all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. And Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. He rose early in the morning and he built an altar at the foot of the mountain and 12 pillars according to the 12 tribes of Israel. And he sent young men of the people of Israel who offered burnt offerings and sacrificed peace offerings of oxen to the Lord. And Moses took half of the blood and put it in basins and half of the blood he threw against the altar. Then he took the book of the covenant and he read it in the hearing of the people. And they said, all that the Lord has spoken we will do and we will be obedient. And Moses took the blood and threw it on the people and said, Behold, the blood of the covenant that the Lord has made with you in accordance with all these words. Then Moses and Aaron and Nadab and Abihu and 70 of the elders of Israel went up and they saw the God of Israel. There was under his feet, as it were, a pavement of sapphire stone, like the very heaven for clearness. And he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. They beheld God and ate and drank. Then the Lord said to Moses, come up with me onto the mountain and wait there that I may give you the tablets of stone with the law <clears throat> with the law and the commandment which I have written for their instruction. So Moses rose with his assistant Joshua and Moses went up to the mountain of God and he said to the elders, wait here for us until we return to you. And behold, Aaron and Hur are with you. Whoever has a dispute, let him go to them. Verse 15, then Moses went up on the mountain and the cloud covered the mountain. The glory of the Lord dwelt on Mount Sinai, and the cloud covered it six days. And on the seventh day, he called to Moses out of the midst of the cloud. Now the appearance of the glory of the Lord was like a devouring fire on top of the mountain in the sight of the people of Israel. Moses entered the cloud and went up on the mountain, and Moses was on the mountain 40 days and 40 nights. This is 
probably, there are probably in, in the Bible a handful of texts that as you read them, you're inclined to think, okay, this is crazy. What must this have been like to experience this, right? And so often this sense of wonder and awe is created by a situation that is beyond our ability to capture it with our finite senses, certainly with our words. And for me, Exodus 24 seems to be such a text because in a sense, it's so hard to try and wrap my mind around what must it have been like to have this experience with such a close and intimate encounter with the God of the universe, God the Father as depicted for us here in Exodus 24, between God and the leaders of the Israelites. There is a suggested closeness here in this text that is unparalleled in our human realm of experience. And the only thing that we might sort of liken it to could be a wedding ceremony. As a marriage covenant is established between a man and a woman as they come together in marriage, and yet even at that, it still falls short of the richness of the covenant that's established here between God and the Israelites. Now, if you've attended a wedding ceremony, which I suspect that most of you have, you're likely familiar with this concept of a covenant. It's a, it's a very central part of the actual wedding ceremony, right? Or at least it should be. And I've had the privilege of officiating quite a few weddings, and I've seen a wide variety of things. In fact, the last two that I've done were also the very first two that involved live animals. If you'd like to know more about it, I'll tell you later. It was fun. It was awesome. I've seen a lot of things. But when you stop and you pull back all the fancy decorations and all the elaborate festivities and you put the animals in their cages, at its very core... A wedding is primarily a covenant-establishing ceremony. That's what it is. It's a celebration and a ratification of a very significant relationship between two people. And yet something interesting is happening in our culture. According to a research or a report issued by Pew Research Center in just February of this year, Americans are staying single longer. They're not as eager as a a culture, we're not as eager to walk down the aisle and to make this covenant as we once were. In fact, uh, according to this report, the median age now for a first marriage, which is 29 years of age, is the highest recorded age on record. Now, we can suspect that there are certainly a number of different variables that are attributing to this rising age. But you can't at least but wonder, and I'm just 100% speculating here, that if one of them is not a growing aversion to the covenant nature of marriage. I mean, why marry when you can live and function as though you were, and yet without the binding covenant hanging over it? It's easier to just move out than to get divorced. D.A. Carson, he wrote a book titled The God Who Is There, which has been particularly helpful for me in drawing a a spiritual parallel to this picture of the covenant. And in chapter three of his book, he asked the rhetorical question, how shall we think of the relationship between God and human beings? And he answers it by giving three common options. The first one he describes as the super soft grandfather, with God functioning like this benevolent gentleman whose only job is to be nice to us and to forgive us and to give us what we want. A second model he suggests is that of deism in which God is so spectacularly great as evidenced by his vast creation that he's created that he cannot even be remotely interested in mine and yours petty little existence. We're but just a a clump of molecules in a cosmos that is immeasurable. And so in this model, God is distant, he's impersonal. A third model suggested by Carson is what he calls a mutual backscratching model, which as the name suggests, it's an exchange of goods. I'll go to church, God, you give me a good job. I'll read my Bible, you cure me of cancer. I'll volunteer my time, you keep my kids out of trouble. And these are just three of what we can accurately assume are numerous different types of ways that man tries to be in relationship with God. They are in essence back doors into a relationship with God all of which are missing the intended covenant nature of the relationship. And you could probably easily see some of the cultural parallels here as well. Our culture attempts to to experience a relationship with another person without the binding covenant nature of marriage. What are those? Cohabitation, sex outside of marriage, even now shared bank accounts, things of that nature. All various forms of coming in the back door of relationship and bypassing the covenant of marriage. And yet one of the themes 
one of the prominent themes developed by the Old Testament and expanded on in the New Testament is that God is a covenantal God. Or to say it a different way, the only way that God relates and is in relationship with his people is through a covenant established by him. God is a covenantal God. And I think Exodus 24 draws this out in a very powerful way. And this is the ratification ceremony that's described here for us. And now some of you are sitting there thinking, okay, you've been talking for 10 minutes and I'm still not exactly sure what you mean by covenant, specifically as it relates to the Bible. And so I just wanna unpack it briefly before we consider the ratification of it and then also the application into our lives. And so let's consider together first the nature of biblical covenants. What are they like? Well, I should tell you from the outset that I'm giving you a very broad look. A lot more can be said than what I'm going to say today about the nature of covenants, but they're very common in the Old Testament. In fact, the Mosaic Covenant, which is established here in Exodus, is not the first covenant that we find in Scripture, nor would it be the last. In fact, you could, you could just go back to Genesis and you would find a number of covenants. I'm thinking specifically of the covenant that God established with Noah right after the flood, or the Abrahamic covenant that God established with Abraham and the nation of Israel in Genesis chapter 12. And those are just two of, of many, but for our purposes, I wanna see common variables and characteristics of most of the covenants. And one of the most distinguishable characteristics is that they always, or sh I should say, quite often followed a pattern. And that pattern was a command followed by some form of a promised blessing. And we see that clearly in the Abrahamic covenant, Genesis 12, you'll see it on your screen. Now the Lord said to Abram, go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. That's the command. And I will make of you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. That's the promise. Beyond this familiar pattern though, we find as well that covenants were often characterized by a, a reciprocal promise of exclusive dedication and loyalty. In essence, it said, I will be their God and they will be my people. A covenant was also characterized by a sense of being chosen and a sense of belonging and inclusion. It served to identify an exclusive relationship just like a marriage relationship does which fostered then intimate knowledge and steadfast love and faithfulness between God and the Israelites. Covenants were deeply relational, deeply relational. And so of course, there was also then a great guard against the covenant ever being broken because it was sacred and it should be guarded and it should be protected at all costs. And so I think it's rather easy to see as we look at this picture of a covenant from maybe 30,000 feet, so to speak, why it would have been so desirable for the Israelites, or really for anybody for that matter, to, to enter into this type of relationship. I mean, who wouldn't want this type of exclusive intimacy with the God of the universe, right? And so it's fairly safe for us to assume then that the Israelites, they're ready and they're eager to ink this deal. Let's, let's get this thing finalized as quickly as possible, maybe before God changes his mind or before we blow it. And you can imagine the sense of anticipation that they must have also experienced as God was inviting them into this sacred relationship. And it's very similar to, to today to the engaged couple. The, the terms of the covenant have been established. There's this great sense of anticipation. They can't wait for the wedding ceremony. They're eager to gather in a public ceremony before God and their friends and family and make it official. Let's go, let's go to the altar, let's make this official. I mean, if you just consider it from the Israelites' perspective, all that God had promised them, if you just went back to, uh, for example, Exodus 23, you would, think, you would find promises there, like he will send his angel before you, he will guard you, he will deliver you to safely to the promised land. If you were to go back even further to chapter 19, you would see God's promise to them that they would be a treasured possession, that they would be a kingdom of priests. And so you say, no wonder they're eager. No wonder they're eager. Show me where to sign, God. Let's do this today, not tomorrow. Let's make this official. And so they did. And that's exactly what chapter 24 depicts for us as we find, secondly, the establishment of the Mosaic Covenant. 
There's a gathering that's taking place here. There's going to be a public ceremony that ratifies and establishes this beautiful covenant. And it begins in verses one and two with God's instruction to Moses to go back down the mountain, having received the law and to get the acceptance of the people and then to come back up the mountain with the leaders of the Israelites. Moses is is essentially headed down the mountain with an invitation from the Lord to the nation of Israel to enter into this covenant relationship with him. He's holding the golden ticket, so to speak. And the response to this divine invitation is what follows and is recorded for us in verses three to eight. And no sooner is Moses down the mountain and verbally communicates all the Lord gave to him Then do we see the eagerness of the people, right? That's verse three. And all the people answered with one voice and said, all the words that the Lord has spoken, we will do. We're ready to commit. We don't need any more info. And yet notice verse four, Moses wrote down all the words of the Lord. I mean, I'm glad you're excited and eager, Israel, but let's get this in writing. I mean, just go, imagine going to buy a house. We like it. We love it, we'll take it, a simple handshake, and they hand you the keys. It just doesn't work that way, does it? Instead, they slide across the table a stack of papers to which you sign your name 80 million times. Let's put this on paper. Let's make sure both parties understand what we are agreeing to. And so now with the terms of this covenant written down, Moses begins the ceremonial practices re- required to ratify the covenant, which, are, which included what? Well, verse four, they build an altar, For what purpose? For both burnt offerings and peace offerings, that's verse five. And burnt offerings, as you might remember, um, typically symbolize atonement for sin, consecration to symbolize devotion and commitment to God. And as the name would suggest, they were burnt 100% on the altar. There was nothing left for the priest to eat. The sacrifice was completely consumed. It was 100% devoted to God. Fellowship offerings, which are also offered here, were offered to celebrate communion and fellowship with God, and they were eaten by the priests and the worshipers alike. And then what follows in verses six to eight is perhaps the most critical piece to this ratification ceremony. If this were a wedding ceremony, this would be the exchanging of the vows. As Moses takes the blood of the sacrifice and he sprinkles some against the altar, that's verse six, and some on the people, that's verse eight. Why? Well, the blood against the altar symbolized God's part in the covenant and the blood on the people, their part in the covenant, which they again verbally affirm there in verse seven. We'll do this. There's blood everywhere, which might seem rather strange, maybe even a bit barbaric, but in the ancient world, covenants were typically sealed with blood. This is where we kind of get the expression or the idea signed in blood. And I love what one commentator says about this, noting, quote, the first function of the blood against the altar is Godward. It must be so, primarily because the need is that God should be satisfied. And so the sprinkling of the altar by Moses symbolized that God had perfected his part in the covenant. And the use of the blood would have also been a clear and a very vivid reminder that this whole arrangement was a matter of life and death, And the keeping of the covenant would ensure life and the breaking of the covenant would ensure that it led to the spilling of blood and death. And yet, this is beautiful, the blood was also a sign of God's mercy as he would not simply show them what would happen if they failed to keep the covenant, but also a way for them to remain in a right relationship with him even after they sinned through the sacrifice. And so in that matter, the blood was purifying in that it allowed them to enter into this covenant with their sin atoned for to begin a new and a right relationship with God. It would be like going to to buy a house and them saying, sorry, you don't qualify, you don't have the credit, only for someone to come in the room, wipe out the debt and say, let's start over. You're fully qualified now. And so having sealed the covenant in the blood, the leaders of Israel now ascend the mountain as God had instructed back in verse one to have this extraordinary encounter with God. And I would say that what follows in verses nine to 11 has to be on a very short list of some of the most fascinating texts in the entire Bible. As they proceed up the mountain and, they, and it says that they saw God before eating and sharing in a covenant meal in his presence. I mean, I thought I was nervous when I met my now father-in-law at Jerry Bob's to ask if I can marry his daughter. What must have they felt? 
So what exactly did they see? Well, very little is mentioned. In fact, it really only described God's surroundings, especially that which was under his feet, something like a pavement of sapphire, but no question this is a vision of God enthroned above them, rightfully exalted, and very similar to Ezekiel's vision of God in Ezekiel chapter one. Moses is at a loss for exactly how to describe it, but safely we can conclude that this is at best a very partial revelation of God's glory. And it's interesting to note for me that the text recognizes the tension involved here with seeing God and yet living to tell about it. That's what verse 11 says, and he did not lay his hand on the chief men of the people of Israel. In other words, they should have died, but they didn't. And not only did they not die, but they shared in this glorious meal in his presence of this manifestation and revelation of God just kind of hovering over them in some capacity and sharing a meal together in the ancient world. But even today, to, to an extent in our culture, was a sign of acceptance. It was a way of, 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 um, in which you declared approval of those who, which you shared a meal with. It was a powerful sign that you belonged there, that you were welcome there. And only parties who were at peace with one another could break bread together. And so symbolized here in this meal was this beautiful picture that God had made peace with these representatives of the people of Israel. And can you just imagine what it must have been like? I mean, just consider their context for a moment. Not all that long ago, you were slaves under this suffocating uh, tyranny of Pharaoh And now you're on the mountain in the presence of God having this meal and you're just trying to wrap your mind around it. Like how in the world do we get from there to here? And then this ratification ceremony ends in verses 12 to 18 as Moses and Joshua to a designated point ascend further up the mountain to receive the tablets of stone which contain the law of God as well as the blueprints, so to speak, for the tabernacle and its furnishings. But it should be noted that God must first be at peace with his people before he calls them into his presence, thereby what? Eliminating their fear of destruction. I'm not going up the mountain as an enemy of God. I don't know about you. God must first make peace and that's exactly what's happened here. And so for six days, we read that Moses waited on the side of the mountain while the cloud covered the top of the mountain. And then on the seventh day, Moses alone is summoned by God to join him where he would stay for 40 days and 40 nights. And as a side note, all that Moses received from, the, from God while on the mountain over this period of time is what's recorded for us in Exodus chapters 25 through 31. But you have to just stop and put yourself in the place of these Israelites down at the base of the mountain It tells us in verse 17 that the appearance of God's glory appeared as a devouring fire on top of the mountain. They're seeing this from afar to them. And for six days, there's your leader safely waiting, waiting, waiting. And then on day seven, up into this perceived devouring fire and gone, he disappears. And so that's the ratification ceremony. Now, if you step back from this scene for a moment, If this were a wedding ceremony and a reception, it would be the type that you would talk about for days afterwards. You would say things like, they spared no expense. It had it all. It was elaborate. It was over the top. It was the nicest wedding I've ever been to. And as weddings go today, this type of ceremony might have carried with it a $50,000 price tag, if not more. It was nothing short of ridiculously extravagant, which then would only intensify your sense of shock if you later learned that within a matter of a few weeks of this elaborate ceremony that you had been a guest at, one of the people married into that covenant had already fallen into an adulterous relationship. You would be like, what? I mean, what about this extravagant ceremony that we all witnessed and that you made your vows to before God and before all your friends and family? Like, What happened? This is exactly the outcome for the nation of Israel. Look at Exodus 32, one. When the people saw that Moses delayed to come down from the mountain, 40 days and 40 nights, right? The people gathered themselves together to Aaron and said to him, up, make us gods who shall go before us. As for this Moses, this man who brought us up out of the land of Egypt, just a little small thing that he did, right? We don't know what has become of him. 
And based on their request for new gods, it would appear also that they don't really care what's happened to Moses. We don't really care, just give us something. Look, we know that we entered into this covenant with God and we celebrated it through this elaborate ratification ceremony, but we've changed our minds, we want out, nullify it. And so no sooner has the ink dried, so to speak, and they're already, they've already broken the covenant which is problematic primarily because the covenant was only ratified on the condition of a mutual commitment and yet one half of the party has already broken their commitment. Now I suspect that as we've walked through this, you've picked up on a lot of the foreshadowing to Christ in the New Testament, but there is a foreshadowing here that's maybe not quite as obvious and that is that the Israelites are a foreshadowing of us. God, all that you have commanded, I will do. Well, did I say that? Because what I meant was, I mean, I can't be the only one in the room that's made ultimatum statements to God. God, I promise you, that is the last time I will ever do fill in the blank. God, I promise you that from here forward, I will always do fill in the blank. And let me say this, this is critical. In those moments when I've made those kind of commitments to God, my heart was 100% pure. I absolutely meant it. And you know something shocking? I think that when the Israelites twice in Exodus 24 pledged full obedience, I believe that they fully meant it. They were totally sincere. So what's the problem? I mean, it doesn't seem to be a matter of desire or interest. So then it must be a matter of ability. And that's what Jesus describes in Matthew 26, 41. Watch and pray that you may not enter into temptation. The spirit is indeed willing. Everybody will commit to it. But the flesh is weak. Which means then that in order for us to experience a covenant relationship with God, We need something greater than the Mosaic Covenant because the Mosaic Covenant depends upon us upholding our side of the bargain and we just can't do that. We will 100% fail all the time. One commentator states, performance ever lags far behind promise. Simply knowing the law does not enable us to keep the law, which then brings us to the natural place where this text leads us and that is to consider thirdly, the ultimate covenant that we need This picture for us of the covenant in Exodus 24 takes us into some of the mysteries of the Christian faith, but it goes even beyond that and shows us what it means to have a true relationship with God. But as we've established, it was also a foreshadowing of a greater covenant to come, a covenant that the the prophets prophesied of, perhaps Jeremiah most clearly in Jeremiah 31, behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a keyword new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt, my covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, we know, we saw the ceremony. For this is the covenant that I will make with them, with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord, I will put my law within them and I will write it on stone tablets. No, but rather I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother saying, know the Lord, for they shall all know me from the least of them to the greatest declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity and I will remember their sin no more. And you say, well, that sounds pretty good, doesn't it? It's almost like God has given up on man, upholding their end of the bargain. And so now he's issuing one-sided covenants that are unconditional and just total acceptance on God's behalf. And yet it's far from unconditional as the conditions of the new covenant were significant and yet satisfied permanently once for all in Christ. Hebrews 9.15, therefore he is the mediator of a what type of covenant? New covenant. So that those who are called may receive the promised eternal inheritance since a death has occurred that redeems them from the transgressions committed under the first covenant. And just a fun fact for you, two thirds of the New Testament uses of the word covenant are found in the book of Hebrews. And with many of these references using the expression new or better, 
to describe it. And we saw that just now in Hebrews 9.15, but I want you to see it elsewhere as well. Hebrews 7.22, this makes Jesus the guarantor of a better covenant. Hebrews 8.6, but as it is, Christ has obtained a ministry that is much more excellent than the old, as the covenant he mediates is better since it is enacted on better promises. And before we consider what's new and what's better, let's consider one thing that is the same because it's critical, and that is that both covenants were ratified with blood. The old with the blood of the animal sacrifice and the new with the blood of Christ. He says so much in Mark 14, and he said to them, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many. Hebrews 9, 12, he entered once for all into the holy places, not by means of the blood or goats and calves, but by means of his own blood, thus securing an eternal redemption. There is no covenant apart from blood and Christ's blood replaced the blood of the animal sacrifice. And so it is through his sacrifice of his own life that we are given a better covenant. Why is it better? Well, namely, as we've already seen, because it's final, it's permanent, it's once for all. It's eternal as Hebrews 13, 20 reminds us. But beyond that, I want you to see a few other reasons which serve only to magnify this new covenant even more. The old covenant you'll recall was a covenant of distance. There were boundaries set for Joshua and the elders and the people of Israel, and only Moses was permitted all the way up. But even at that point, it was after a a said period of time. And he served as the mediator of the people. But now, in the new covenant, and this is a beautiful promise, with Christ as our mediator, the new covenant has allowed us to experience complete fellowship with the Father unmediated fellowship with the Father. That's what Ephesians 2.13 is all about. But now in Christ Jesus, you who were once far away, you were down at the base of the mountain, have been brought near by the blood of Christ, all the way up to the top of the mountain. How superior now then is the standing for those who have come to the cross and to Christ our mediator, allowing us to experience the full glory and the full splendor of the Father. It's God's way of saying, you are welcome here. You belong here. Come all the way to the top of the mountain because Christ has mediated the new covenant for you. Secondly, in addition to knocking down the boundary between God and man, the new covenant has also reserved our seat at the table. You'll recall that one of the more striking pieces of this ratification ceremony in Exodus 24 was the leaders sharing in a meal in the presence of God in verse 11, which no doubt reminded these leaders that they were at peace with God through the covenant. It was, it was an indication of God's full acceptance of them. And yet, for as significant as that meal was, it was but a foreshadowing of a much more significant meal that will be shared at the marriage supper of the Lamb, which is the final messianic banquet. That's Revelation 19, 9. And the angel said to me, write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, these are the true words of God. And so you may think, well, that sounds awesome, but what is it? What's the final covenantal meal depicted for us in Scripture intensifying this picture of Christ being joined together? in an unbreakable bond with his people. It's the wedding reception that just never ends. You just celebrate it for eternity. It's an unbreakable bond, and it's Christ's celebration of his final victory over sin and evil. And you ask, who will be at the divine meal? Well, Jesus gives us one answer, Matthew 8, 11. I tell you, many will come from the east and from the west, and they will recline at table with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. In other words, any and all who have come to the cross in response to the gospel being taken to every corner of the world. And the prophet Isaiah gives us a fuller picture of this divine meal, again, attended by those whose lives have been transformed by the grace of the gospel. I love this verse so much. Isaiah 25, on this mountain, the Lord of hosts will make for all peoples a feast of rich food, a feast of well-aged wine, of rich food full of marrow, of aged wine well refined. You're like, yeah, I see why you like it. That has nothing to do with it. (laughs) This is the part I love. He will swallow up on this mountain the covering that is cast over all the peoples, the veil that is spread over all nations. 
Veils conceal things. He will swallow up death forever, and the Lord God will wipe away tears from all faces, and the reproach of his people he will take away from the earth, for the Lord has spoken. Can you picture it? That's what this divine meal will be. People upon people upon people who have had their reproach taken away and their tears wiped away. We just recently returned from taking a team of our students over to San Diego where we got to serve with a church called New Vision Church and they have a separate ministry. Um, it's an urban, urban outreach ministry. And part of our time spent there was serving the homeless community in downtown San Diego, which is massive. It's a, it's, a, it's a huge challenge that's facing their city. And admittedly, when we set out to do some street outreach, I had some preconceived ideas. I probably had some prejudices. I certainly had some fears. But as you begin walking through these streets, up and down the streets, and you, you have a food bag, and they, they trained us how to have these conversations, you start praying with these men and women and you start talking to them, you quickly start to realize that these are people who are desperate for a place to belong. They have no place to belong. They're desperate for hope. They long for meaningful connection to someone. You know how? Because they'll talk your ear off if you give them the opportunity. They want a place to belong. And most of them are incredibly lonely. And this is a community that is marked by a lot of sadness and a lot of shame and a lot of brokenness, and to use the words of Isaiah, a lot of reproach over these people. And it was, one, it was through one very specific experience that I don't even think the students know about <clears throat> that the Lord gave me that really opened my eyes to the full promise of the restorative nature of the new covenant. And it happened on a Sunday morning while we were there. I was sitting in a rental van doing my devotions because it was, I don't know, just felt like a good place to do it. Um, and I'm sitting there and I watch as this lady who very clearly looks homeless comes up to the porta potties that were on the church property and she goes into to one with all kinds of bags and so I assume you know, she's going in there to clean herself up basically and she was in there for quite a while. I didn't think much of it. She came out some point later and she, just, and she walked away and I didn't give it two more thoughts and then about an hour later I'm sitting in church waiting for church to start <clears throat> and I look down to the end of my row and there's this woman sitting there, I think with her husband who's also homeless. You'll see a picture of that on the screen. She's the one with the hood on her head. And I took this picture discreetly because I didn't want to forget this moment because this is a parallel picture of what the new covenant does. In Jesus, those who are far off those who have reproach and shame and sorrow and no place to belong, they're brought near. And the church serves as a temporary microcosm of this place where cultural barriers are broken down and we come together as one body. If we have nothing else in common, we have the blood of the new covenant in Christ in common. And yet someday the temporary church will give way to an eternal divine feast in the presence of God in eternal capacity around the throne of God. And many will come from the east and from the west and out of the homeless community and out of the LGBT community who have all had their shame taken away and been redeemed by the blood of Christ. And they will come and they will dine together in the presence of God. And it's happening in the church today in a temporary capacity because God is a covenantal God. And the beautiful thing about this couple is that after church dismissed, they went down into the basement and they shared a meal with all the churchgoers like they were a part of the family. And then Wednesday, I saw them in the park because they're homeless. What unites us? Just the blood of Jesus. What gives us a place to belong? Just the blood of Jesus. What gives us hope? And we're tempted to glamorize this and say, man, what a powerful story. But this is a picture of you and me outside of Jesus. You didn't have a place to belong. There was shame on your life. There was reproach over your life. And through Christ, you've been brought near all the way up the mountain. Because God is a covenantal God and his invitation that he's extended through Christ and the cross is that you come 
You don't need to clean yourself up first. You just come straight in, unmediated. I struggle to say, like, what's the takeaway from this? I don't know other than to say, I'm not sure that all of us here today know him in this capacity. I mean, there are options, perceived options of ways to come in back door of relationship with God, but there's only one way and that's through a covenant. Through the the covenant made possible through Christ and and his gift of his life on the cross. And you know something? It's a better covenant. And it's available to all of us today. Step into it, be restored, be made whole, find life, find life abundantly in Christ. Let's pray together. Jesus, we, we come um, ever, ever, ever aware of our inability to uphold our end of the covenant. And yet, Father, through your grace and through your love, you made it possible that we could experience a new covenant, a better covenant, one that we could not uphold, one that we could not even contribute to, but in Christ Jesus, those who were once far off have been brought near all the way to the top of the mountain where we've experienced and will experience someday peace with you. And this full glorious picture of what it means to have a place to belong. We live in a world where there are so many lonely people. We live in a world where there are so many people who are desperate for some place to belong. And so we come knowing that around the blood of the cross, the blood of Christ and the gift of his life to us, for us, we experience a new and a better covenant and life and life eternal in Christ. And so we thank you and we give you the praise and we sing to you now, Jesus. In Christ's name we pray, amen. Amen.